If you have ever created any automation before, you most likely have heard of the term JSON, but what exactly is it? In this video, I'm going to share with you my experience about JSON, what it actually is, what I learned along the way in a simple format so that you can understand it. I will not ask you for any previous knowledge about JSON constructs whatsoever, and I try to keep the language as simple as possible to make it understandable for you so that you can get a better feeling for it, can implement it into your tasks, and even use that information for debugging and building better workflows. We are covering everything from what a JSON construct is along with some examples. We will also go over three common mistakes that I face are literally the majority of issues our clients have when building JSON constructs along with some extra bonuses at the very end. So stay tuned. All right, let's get right into the presentation. First of all, I'd like to explain to you what a JSON construct actually is. And in the end, it is just a structured way of packing data into something to make it understandable for something called robots. And we call robots in our example robots because it contains actually wide range of things, which can be servers, which can be automation tools, which can be internal tools, which can be testing software. There are plenty of things that you can use to automate things. But in our example, we literally just call them robots to make things simpler. But you know that in the end, there's basically something technological happening. So again, JSON is basically the way the language that robots use to communicate within each other, even though there are more languages, but we come to that later. And it is a very, very simple and structured way that brings like a perfect balance between making things understandable for a computer or a robot and making things understandable for a human as well because you can structure them and read them very easily. To give you an example, we are going to head over to the next slide and here you can see a very, very basic example of a JSON construct that contains curly brackets, which is always the indicator of a JSON. It either is curly brackets or square brackets, depending on the format, but we come to that later. But as you can see here on the screen, we have a success key, which basically defines something. So whatever you have in keys is usually something that we use to define things if it's not an array of specific elements that don't need a specific definition. So success basically means we are looking for a status in that case and it is set to true, which basically means in the sense of JSON and AI that this specific request was successful. If you have not heard about a request, I made a tutorial about that before, so you can check that video out as well. So you get a better understanding of what requests actually are because those mostly leverage JSON constructs. But for now, we just focus on the JSON. The second key you see is MSG, which usually stands for message and it contains some more information about the actual request or whatever happened. If you do an action, so you make an API call somewhere, you usually get some information back. And in that case, it says user created, so we can basically assume that this specific request has been made to an API to create a user and this was the answer response. We can also see the user ID which is basically here within double quotes which can be also written without the double quotes because integers don't necessarily need double quotes and that can also be something that can become very confusing if you really custom code APIs but that's a topic for another time. And lastly you see a user key that contains another sub JSON including the first name and last name. This basic structure is what you see in a lot of requests. It is a very common structure that still doesn't apply to all of the endpoints because everyone uses different notations. And that is something that you will learn on the way because you need to be very flexible because everyone makes things a little bit different. But to know a structure like that helps you a lot to just debug things and get a better understanding of what JSON is in the first place. So here we basically learned that keys define some specific or they have some meaning and the actual value of that meaning is what we actually put into the the value which is separated by the double points and then the value. True is basically considered boolean, you probably should know that. A number is usually an integer but this integer is wrapped in double quotes so it's still interpreted as a string and so do the first name, last name and the message. Alright, now you know what a JSON is but what actually does a JSON or how it actually looks like in action if you use it with automation services like Zapier or make.com or even like voice flow. And here I prepared a little example using make.com and it literally leverages that specific JSON I showed you, which you see down here again for simplicity reasons. And when I sent this specific JSON, for example, to a webhooks endpoint within make.com, you can see that the output looks very similar to what we have here, which is success equals true message, user ID, user first name, last name, which is literally the exact same setup. So what make.com basically does is it just structures the data in a more visual way so that you as an end user don't need to understand the actual structure of JSON, but you can just see it in a specific hierarchy that you can then use again with your next tasks. 
so it makes things easier for you to read and to process again afterward. But in the end, what happens behind is most likely JSON. And I say most likely because other structures can use a very, very similar format as well, which we will discover at a later point. Now to tell you a little bit more about other common types that are used for like data formats, which I also consider the content types, because that is usually what you define within the request. And those are XML, they are query strings, and lastly, they are meme types, which is nothing else but images that you can stream through a specific response. But let's go over them step by step. XML is basically a structured way of showing your data just like JSON does it, but it seems a little bit more complex to read for humans because it uses the HTML notation. So you wrap stuff within greater and smaller, I'd say brackets or signs, however you call it. And inside there's a value. So you have basically a beginning tag, an ending tag, and in between you have the actual value. So you always need to have two tags at the beginning and the end, which makes things very, very complex to read, in my opinion. So it is something that is used for older webhooks or for, I would say, bigger companies also often use those specific formats if they are already in the market for a very, very long time because they have been built on that. But if you see newer tools, you usually don't need to worry because all of them kind of leverage JSON nowadays. Then you also have query string, which is also something that is actually pretty common. And it is mostly used in no-code solutions because it makes things a little bit easier since they can just send online form. It's usually called XWWW URL encode. So it is a specific form that they send along, which basically just wraps all of this information up in a single string. It is very, very hard to read for humans, but bots and uh, these robots can interpret it very easily. So they always use a separator as an ensign for separating the specific variables, I would call them. And the variable usually also consists of a key separated by an equal sign and than the actual value. The difficulty with that is that you also need to encode the data more specifically. So there are functions in mostly all of the languages that you use and predefined tools like make.com do that for you. So you never need to worry about that in the first place. But just remember, it's actually a very, very complicated thing to read as a human. So we usually try to avoid it, except of in no-code solutions, because there you anyway see it in a visual way where you can literally just add usually line items within a table and it does the rest for you. The meme types is a little bit different because that literally allows you to kind of of stream files through a webhook, which means you don't get a JSON back, you don't get an XML back or anything like that, but you literally get binary data back from a specific endpoint. So you can take all of this data without reading or understanding it, just dropping it in a local file, naming it somewhere, giving it the extension of whatever file type it actually is, and then save it. So you basically kind of created a file. And that's mostly anything about the data structures and the different content types. There are a lot more that I could go into, but those ones are the main ones I have seen over the past years, which are mostly common in some ways. And you will most likely discover them depending on which industry you're in, more or less. But I always just believe JSON is still like one of the biggest ones that mostly everyone uses. All right, the next thing is three common mistakes that I see with JSON constructs when building them, when helping other people on supporting and figuring out issues, because a lot of things just break because of very, very simple things that JSON requires because it's very, very sensitive. Imagine there must be, there's one little thing that is missing. It can be just one character and your whole JSON construct will not be readable anymore by the robot. And that makes things super difficult. And we try to avoid that by just following very simple guidelines. And those three specific things I've realized happen are mostly like 80% of the time the issue for all of the problems our customers faced. The first one is a trailing comma at the end of a specific item. And in that case, we talk about an array item, which means we are not starting the JSON with a curly bracket, but we started with a square bracket. So if there is a trailing comma at the end of any last value, it basically expects another value. And if there's no value coming, it just throws an arrow and the whole thing will not be usable anymore. So that is something you need to be very careful to not add any kind of comma at the end of a JSON item that has nothing else to follow except the closing curly brackets or the closing square bracket. The second thing is unescaped double quotes. So what happens a lot with other specific tools that allow you to do things with no code. They mostly validate those things for you, so you don't need to do them yourself. But there are some tools out there that don't do that. So if you include, for example, variables and those variables contain text and some of the text is wrapped within double quotes, it might break your JSON if they don't escape that. And you can see that here in the screenshot as well. It's probably very small from your side, but you can see that the left side of the string is orange, so it has been interpreted properly. And at the right, you see there's some gray characters and the numbers are in green, which means there is something off. And it is because of the double quotes not being escaped. And to escape double quotes within a JSON, you just put a backslash before them. And that basically deactivates that specific double quote to actually be 
representative within the JSON structure instead of the actual content. The last thing is very similar to the double quotes, which is an unescape line break. So in case you have a line break, you have to escape the line break using backslash and an N, which is the equivalent to the actual line break you have. So whenever you decode a JSON construct, it will become back to the line break that you have. So you usually don't need to worry about that. And it's the exact same thing as you can see in the screenshot here. All of the actual strings are orange. That specific string with the line break is green because it cannot properly be interpreted because it just doesn't end. So there's something wrong. And that's it for those kind of common mistakes. If you take care of these three little issues and you avoid them, you can most likely rule out the majority of issues that I faced in the past especially for you when building JSON constructs, you always want to make sure that everything works and is easily to understand. So if something breaks, definitely check for those reasons first, because it's most likely that one of those is actually the cause of it. Now we are coming to the first bonus example, which is another JSON structure that I was talking about earlier, very briefly, which is the square brackets on the outside of the actual JSON. So you will see that a lot that JSON constructs use square brackets and the curly brackets, and the difference is very similar as you can see here. The square brackets usually have no no key but they just have a single value which is the whole curly bracket separated by a comma and in this case another curly bracket JSON with more additional information. What that usually does is it contains an array notation which means in front you can imagine that there's a key because there is a key it's just not visible and the key is usually an integer so nothing else than a number and it is very important to mention that when we are talking about numbers and arrays they never start with one they always start with zero so as you can see here in the example if you want to add address that specific email, you would take the JSON, you would address it with a zero, which means the first entry, which is this specific part here, and then we are accessing the email within it. So if you would like to address the second email, we would change the zero to a one and we can address the second part. We are currently launching an online academy or creating it and are very, very eager to explain you more about those things. So you will definitely see more videos about that within the academy. And I also try to promote more of that stuff on my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in that, feel free to comment it down below and I will also try to make a new video on this channel. Lastly, to give you an extra bonus that I think is very, very cool and neat to have is a complete resource on all the tools we use within the web browser to debug, to optimize, to manipulate JSON constructs. And all of that is for free available on our hub under hub.integraticus.com. So you can simply set up an account yourself, log in and use all of those tools for free. And we also included some extra stuff like how you can actually use AI to fix JSON constructs for you so that you don't even have to do that in case something goes wrong. And I hope this was helpful for you for now. I know it's a lot to cover and I know we will definitely go more in depth in future into JSON. So if you have any specific questions, feel free to drop them down below in the comments. And otherwise, I'm looking forward to see you at the next tutorial.